Heather. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and begin our class with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come uh, entering your presence with uh, thanksgiving in our hearts, with joy at just uh, the wonderful week this past uh, that you've given us, that we can uh, face the, the challenges of, of finding ourselves each and every day, moving forward, growing, coming to a better understanding of you, your son, your word, and ever striving to walk in those paths. Heavenly Father, may our time that we spend this morning in study <clears throat> first serve to further that uh, understanding, serve to further our understanding of not only your word in your way, but uh, the, the many other ways that uh, others take that we might try to impact their lives, help them and uh, win them to your way of thinking. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this family that meets here, the encouragement that we can receive by meeting together, the strengthening, the, the challenging of one another to, to always uh, move forward and to, and to grow in, in grace, to grow in our ability to minister to those who are about us uh, each and every day. Heavenly Father, we pray for those of our number that are sick, undergoing testing, finding their way through rehabilitation, and be with them and, and care for them as only you can. Strengthen us as we strive to minister unto them, to let them know indeed they are part of a family that loves them and cherishes uh, time spent with them. Heavenly Father, we once again ask you to be with us during this time of study this morning. We know that uh, all those good and wonderful things come from you and and when we align our, our hearts and our minds with, with your way of thinking, that our, our life is, is so much better. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you most of all for your son who went to a cross, and died so that we can have the, the salvation that you offer. It's in his name that we pray. And amen. <clears throat> all right. We are beginning today the last of our series of uh, world uh, religions. Um, we've gone through a, a couple of them. I think we've hit most of uh, the major ones. Uh, and we're here down uh, to the very, very last one. And <clears throat> we've got to say kind of up front that in many, many circles, um, this particular study would not be perceived. Um, and actually, many would deny uh, that uh, it is a religion at all, uh, partly because they claim to be anti-religious. Uh, anti-religious. Uh, but uh, it, the more you study them, uh, the more you come to find out uh, how it is that they think, uh, the, the more it begins to <clears throat> not only look like uh, a philosophy to live your life by, uh, but uh, a religious practice, uh, so to speak. Uh, of course, the, the word religion uh, just simply means uh, to be devoted uh, to, uh, to an idea, to be committed to, to a concept, uh, and usually as part of that concept, there is some sort of you know, ritualistic uh, practice. Uh, but the, the final one that we're going to consider kind of lies beneath all of the other ones. Uh, and um, sort of creates the, the uh, foundation, uh, whether they would accept it or not, uh, of any man-made uh, religion. Uh, so this morning we're going to be talking a little bit, uh, and we'll talk some next week too, uh, about humanism. Uh, humanism. Uh, now humanism is a term that's uh, tossed around a, a great deal. Uh, it has been since uh, the 1970s when uh, the, the first of the Humanist Manifestos was written. It was revised and rewritten later, uh, and um, the Humanist Manifesto too. Um, and uh, in those manifestos, uh, they spell out very clearly, uh, very clearly what it is that uh, they, they stand for. Uh, and it's important to, to note uh, up front uh, that uh, humanism <clears throat> is not a philosophy that is born out of uh, just, you know, simple uh, philosophical exploration uh, to the point where we are creating, you know, for ourselves uh, a, a manner of life that is uh, somewhat unique and based upon, uh, you know, rationale and, and experience. Humanism, for the most part, is a reaction. 
Uh, it is a reactionary philosophy uh, to what uh, the people who created it perceived as <clears throat> either injustices or um, things that were wrong, you know, with the world. Uh, one of the big things that they see wrong with the world uh, is the pursuit of religious activity. Uh, the pursuit of, of God, uh, the pursuit of, of church and, and uh, uh, all of the things that the, the church, you know, stands for. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you, you know, you're going to have uh, within that uh, the, the various different doctrines that are associated with uh, the church. So pretty much anything God, Christ, Bible, church, and church related uh, are going to be the things that they typically uh, address. And those anti-positions have become uh, their philosophy. Uh, but it's not as if they sat down uh, and determined <clears throat> in some you know, rational way uh, that these things were, you know, untrue, uh, or, well, not untrue, but that, that um, you know, these things in and of themselves were concepts that uh, are uh, not worthy uh, of our, <clears throat> you know, uh, worthy of our pursuit. Uh, instead, again, they are just simply uh, reaction. So what is humanism? Uh, and how does it differ, for instance, from, you know, atheism? Like we've done with every single lesson, I'm going to first throw it open to you guys. What do you know, uh, if anything, about humanism? Wayne? <clears throat> Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, it, it does, uh, you know, if you talk to folks who are humanistic, they'll tell you it dates all the way back to the, the Greece and, you know, 
uh, that uh, kind of philosopher age and Aristotle and Plato and, you know, Socrates. And uh, they kind of cherry pick some things um, that, you know, perhaps don't give us a, a proper context in which to interpret a modern movement. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, man is the measure of all things. Well, in, in some sense, that could be a true statement, uh, even within the realm of, uh, you know, Christianity. Uh, but um, to put that in the context that's wrapped in, you know, uh, atheism uh, is going to be a serious uh, error uh, to make. And, and that's essentially what they do. And, and I would just change one little part of the verbiage. Um, you'll see very clearly uh, that... Uh, Humanism, of course, having the word human in it, um, would seem to imply that they do value above all things uh, life, um, human life, to be more specifically. But that's not really the case. Um, what they value uh, above more than everything uh, is individual human rights to their own thoughts. Okay? Um, it, it would be, you'd be hard-pressed uh, to find the, the, the humanist person who would argue uh, that life uh, is the value that is, um, you know, the, the highest, uh, you know, ethic, so to speak. Uh, because many of their things are very much contrary to that, uh, as we'll soon, you know, discover. Um, so you've got to kind of be, you know, nuanced in the language. Uh, and that's really the difference between atheism and humanism. Um, you know, a athe humanism is kind of a, uh, a, a subtle, um, well-verbed, uh, well-spoken form uh, of atheism that has been turned into more of a, a mantra and a practice um, that can be sort of delineated and described. Whereas atheism is just kind of, you know, a sort of a loosey-goosey type of designation that we give to anybody who doesn't believe in a, a god. And, you know, humanism is, is the creation of a, a slick, sort of well-marketed system that is designed to impact the world in a phil philosophical way. Um, humanism is the movement. A atheism is perhaps one of the seeds uh, that, uh, you know, drives the growth of it. Uh, but uh, humanism is that full-blown system. All right, anyone else? What do we know about humanism? No? Okay, well, let's jump right in into the notes. If you have the notes, I'm on page two. Uh, if you don't have the notes, I I'm not sure if there's any back there or not. Uh, if you need them in electronic format, I can email them to you. Um, just let me know. Uh, if you need a printed copy, uh, let me know, and I can print one of those too. But we're only going to be here for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to do this week and next week, uh, and then, um, uh, of course, uh, I'll be gone for a time. Uh, so the other individuals who are taking over the class and filling in, uh, they're going to be doing uh, different subjects with the class during the month of July. So um, I'm just going to read you the words of a guy by the name of Richard Leakey, uh, who is a famous uh, paleontologist. Uh, he said, there is now a critical need for a deep awareness that no matter how special we are as an animal, we are still part of a greater balance of nature. During that relatively brief span, uh, brief uh, span evolutionary pressures forged a brain capable of profound understanding of matters animate and inanimate. The fruits of intellectual and technological endeavor in this latter quarter of the 20th century give us just an inkling of what the human mind can achieve. The potential is enormous, almost infinite. We can, if we so choose, do virtually anything. Arid lands will become fertile, terrible diseases will be cured by genetic engineering, uh, touring other planets will become routine. We may even come to understand how uh, the human mind um, works, how the human mind works. Now, is science an amazing thing? Yes, it is. And do we understand vast uh, amounts about the, the human body and the world around us? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, but you'll notice here, uh, some of the language uh, goes well beyond uh, the understanding that, that we have. He's talking about things infinite. He's talking about there is no end to the possibilities uh, of human thoughts or, or endeavor. Uh, and about the only thing he doesn't say is that uh, eventually we, because of our own mind power and thought, uh, will be able to live forever um, and become truly infinite creatures. But it's the implication of what he writes. Uh, and you'll find 
that uh, most humanistic thought is kind of along this line. It, it sounds really, really good on, on the surface. Well, yeah, human beings have great potential. Well, yeah, they're very, very, you know, smart. Uh, and they'll talk about science, and science can be, science can be a great thing, right? Uh, Christians are not anti-science, shouldn't be at least. Um, you know, uh, and they'll talk philosophy, and Christians shouldn't be anti, you know, philosophical. Um, but when you get to the heart of it, it's the subtlety of language that puts man above all things. Uh, or to put it simpler, uh, in the place uh, of God. Uh, you know, now Paul, in the book of Romans, basically tells us this is nothing new, right? Right? Uh, it's nothing new. If you go over to the book of the book of Romans, and Paul uh, starts there in chapter one, going up through chapter three, he talks about the common errors that men make, um, and of course sin. Uh, but uh, the common errors that men make in their thinking. Uh, he starts with the Gentile, and he works his way uh, to the Jew. Uh, and one of the things he says about the Gentile world uh, is that even though they knew God, uh, what happened? Do you remember? Even though, they, even though they knew God, they did not retain God uh, in their knowledge. Okay? They did not retain God in their knowledge, but uh, and later on he's going to say things like, they, what's that? Yeah, they became futile in their thinking, uh, futile in their thinking, uh, and eventually they reached this point where they are worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Uh, so it, it's really nothing due. And humanism can be reduced to what Paul says uh, there in the book of Romans. Uh, it is misplaced worship uh, and thinking uh, that derives uh, not only origins, but meaning and substance and purpose, not from a God or a creator, uh, but rather a, a, an evolutionary process uh, that falls short, even in scientific terms, uh, of really explaining um, much of what we experience, not only in, in history, but even up until our own, you know, day and age. Uh, it, it falls on its face uh, to explain many of the things that we commonly encounter on a, on a regular, you, you know, basis, uh, even in our, you know, own uh, existence. Um, so we've truly... Uh, in the form of humanism, uh, have gone back to that estimation that Paul makes of the Gentiles uh, and have put the creature uh, above the creator. Uh, you, you know, humanism has several altars. Okay? Well, one of them is, and certainly the biggest uh, among them, uh, is that uh, which is uh, human. Uh, human thought uh, human uh, choice, human decision, uh, human, and there's a host of other things you can kind of put in there, uh, is the pinnacle uh, of existence. There's nothing more than that, nothing more than that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, another one of the altars uh, is an altar that kind of supports the first one, uh, is uh, science, uh, is science. Uh, they believe that, uh, you know, everything should be and uh, must be verifiable through some means of scientific method. Okay? If you can't do that, uh, then uh, it simply should not be considered. Uh, so you, you have this definite uh, bowing uh, at the altar of you know, scientific uh, endeavor. Uh, but of course, we're very, very selective uh, when it comes to you know, that. Um, and of course, we'll see some of the other altars along the way, but what they're all going to have in common uh, is a humanness. Uh, a humanness. Uh, they are all man-made. They are all man-generated. Uh, they are all man-supported, uh, and um, therefore, you know, in the in the Christian philosophy, uh, destined to fail. Destined to fail. Glenn. Okay. Yeah, and um, 
like I say, it's it's very common. I mean, you like Glenn pointed out, you you don't have to stop uh, in history at the Book of Romans. You you can go back well before that, uh, and, and um, you know realize that God God has given us the the freedom to choose. You know, the freedom to choose right and wrong, uh, the freedom to, you know, take a life or to support life, uh, the, the freedom to, you know, you, you know, you name it. God has given us that uh, choice. Uh, and because that is the case, you know, many will choose to simply serve themselves uh, and to set up themselves and other human beings as sort of the pinnacle of, uh, you, you know, their... Uh, not only existence, but uh, the you know the way that uh, they, they function on a da- daily basis. It's all about them and you know their their family. Uh, and uh, there's these seeds that you know germinate, uh, and from that basic idea uh, of you know human endeavor being you know the chief thing in life, uh, that filter into just about every part uh, of our world. Uh, and it's real easy. Uh, you know, to uh, adopt uh, a, a humanistic approach to just about anything, really. Uh, you know, there, <clears throat> there, there actually is a, well, we won't get off on it, but I mean, if you, you can look it up, uh, and, um, you know, I would do so in, you know, literature that you trust, for instance, Apologetics Press or the Christian Courier or, you know, something along that line. But uh, there is a humanist Christian, uh, you know, movement. Uh, and, um, you know, you, you can explore some of, uh, some of those things that, you know, they do. Um, and um, any, anyhow, anyone else? Yes. Okay, if you didn't hear Vivian, she points out the passage that says, uh, uh, every way of a man is right uh, in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth, uh, you know, the heart. Um, you know, I mean, we, we look at the things that we do and we look at our own actions and, you know, no doubt think that they're right. Uh, and we give ourselves, you know, a certain amount of credence uh, and, uh, you know, weight. Uh, it's when we go beyond that. Uh, when we go beyond that, that it becomes difficult uh, for us. I'm going to read you one other quote, um, and, and I think it's just kind of the best way to sort of sum up, um, you know, humanistic type of thinking. <clears throat> this is by Aldous Huxley uh, in Confessions of a Professed Atheist. He says, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning, consequently assumed it had none, and was able, without any difficulty, to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He is also concerned to prove there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. For myself, as no doubt for many of my contemporaries, a philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we derived was simultaneously liberation from a certain, <clears throat> certain political and economic system of liberation for a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. Uh, and uh, if you look at all of the different tenets of humanism, uh, that's essentially what Huxley says. Um, that's essentially what you're going to, to find. Uh, that freedom is key here. But when the humanist talks about freedom, they're talking about uh, an ultimate sense of freedom uh, on every level. You know, you, you should be able to make as much money as you want, no matter how many people you have to step on, lie about, crush, destroy, or eliminate. That's your prerogative. And that's why we clarified what Wayne said about valuing human life. Um, that's just simply not the case. Um, it's sort of the ends justify the means sort of mentality. Uh, humanistic thought uh, means first and foremost, you're putting the human you know best, the one that you see in the mirror every day, first and foremost, uh, in your own existence. Uh, now, <clears throat> that's not the way humanism is marketed. If you talk about, um, 
you know, the writings uh, and uh, the political standpoints and the talking points, so to speak. Uh, humanism is marketed as uh, sort of a good for supporting, you know, society and upholding, you know, moral and ethical uh, behavior for the good of mankind rather than the individual. Uh, and on the surface, that sounds really, really good. You know, who doesn't support, you know, bettering mankind? Who doesn't support creating social and political and economic, uh, you know, structures that support mankind? But that's not really what they do. Uh, you know, that's just uh, something that we say. It's truly a philosophy that looks good on paper, but is not lived out very well. Uh, because ultimately, it comes down to, um, I have this freedom that you can't take away. And anything that gets in the way uh, has to be eliminated. And that's why we're anti-God, and that's why we're anti-church, and that's why we're anti-Bible, uh, and so on and so forth. Because the church <clears throat> comes along, uh, the church that is truly, you know, a, a Christ-following church, uh, and uh, a Bible-following church uh, is going to come along and, and stand uh, against their movement on, on a number of, you know, levels. Because not everything is economically permissible. Not everything <clears throat> is politically uh, permissible. Not everything is morally, you know, permissible uh, and, and should not be embraced. Uh, but with humanism, Freedom is one of those tenets uh, that is held dear, uh, and you have no right to tell somebody else uh, that they are wrong because they are in the midst of the pursuit of being the best human that they think they can be. That makes sense? You know, and it's not your place to, to come along and tell them that that's not the best human that they can be. Okay? Wayne? <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I, I think that um, if you want to kind of change the, the verbiage a little bit, um, you know, that, I guess you got to realize that that's the constant battle for every human being. Uh, it's in, you know, the, we are told in the scripture that <clears throat> uh, the, the Christian warfare, the battle that we wage, the, you know, reason why we put that armor on is because there is a, <clears throat> a spiritual war that's, you know, raging and, it, and the, the, the sides are, you know, light and dark uh, and there are children of God and children of, and we use that word, the world, uh, the world. And sometimes we use the word, well, that's very worldly. Uh, or we talk about the world. And, and what you've got to realize is that, you know, on most cases, when he's talking about that world, he's not talking about this physical world that he created, looked down on, and said was good. He's talking about a, a worldly system. 
uh, that does everything from denies his existence. You know, the fool, I mean, all the way back in the wisdom literature, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, so God's not unaware that people will deny his existence. Uh, he wasn't unaware, uh, as we go into the New Testament, that, you know, people would deny that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, I mean, all the way back in Isaiah 53, you know, how, do, how does it begin? You know, it's quoted later on, you know, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of people who, who don't believe. Uh, and um, there are going to be even people who sit in churches every Sunday who really don't believe. It's not who they are. It's more about some external manifestation of an agenda that has been simply built into them by habit. But it's not a defining point of their existence. It's not something that brings them purpose or hope or meaning. Uh, it's just something they do by, uh, you know, rote. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who? Who that does the will of my Father, right? So there are going to be some who religiously uh, or spiritually are going to be very surprised because they thought it was all about, you know, them showing up at a building and them doing something. And it was all really kind of about them. Uh, so if you want to call that humanistic, you know, because it is them based, you know, uh, anytime we have the, an I based philosophy of life and everything else kind of stems from it, you know, I'm not going to go to church tonight because I don't feel like it. You know, I'm not going to do, and, and, you know, anytime we have that type of religious philosophy, then it does, you know, border on, you know, humanistic type of thinking. Um, you know, but it's certainly, that type of thinking is certainly different um, uh, on many levels than what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about a, a well-organized organization that um, <clears throat> has made a protracted effort to, you, you know, sway the thinking uh, of people on national levels uh, toward a more worldly mindset. I mean, that's the result, uh, but they do so through this, uh, you know, influence that, even though it's very subtle, uh, is very human-based uh, and, you know, and very contradictory to Christianity. Well, sure. Yeah, pretty much. And, and you do see the two crossing over. You, you do see the two crossing over. For instance, uh, I, I don't remember. I'm thinking it was like back in the, the 80s, maybe 70s. Um, and, and I'm... Don't know if I have the dates right or not. If somebody knows them, you can correct me. Uh, but there was a, a really big effort uh, in many churches, but, uh, you know, Churches of Christ, uh, of course, um, across the, the, the country to adopt a, a mindset that saw the blending of evolutionary thinking with creationism. Uh, you, you know, we, we so much wanted to kowtow to popular science uh, that we came up with a scheme by which we could mesh, you, you know, uh, evolutionary type of thinking and, um, you know, the biblical narrative. Uh, and um, most people have abandoned that. There, there's still folks who, who kind of, you know, b believe it. Uh, but, but the science just isn't there. Uh, but, you know, we don't want to necessarily go down that path just yet. But um, you do see uh, organized efforts uh, of humanistic types of thinkings and outcroppings of philosophy um, in political and social practices uh, getting into the church. For, for instance, another big one is, um, you know, we maybe don't realize it, but one of the big pushes uh, of humanistic uh, thinking uh, has to do with sexuality. Uh, they talk a lot about sexuality, uh, and it doesn't take a genius, and I don't have to go into it, um, that that's a big thing today. 
you know, gender identity and, you, you know, the whole um, LG, you know, all of that stuff. Um, yeah, all of that. Um, you know, I, I mean, the rightness or wrongness of it aside, there is a big push uh, to uh, squelch any other voice except for that voice, which basically says this. I can do whatever I want to sexually, and you have to accept me. Uh, why? Why do I have to accept you? Well, that goes back to that humanistic type of thinking. Uh, that is, you know, what one human has chosen for their life, and how dare you uh, tell another human what to do. Um, that's humanistic philosophy. We are gods unto ourselves, uh, and therefore, you, you know, have the right to choose whatever it is that we want to do, um, which, you know, I mean, anybody can kind of see through that, you know, because on one hand, you have a right to choose it, but I don't have a right to oppose it. Um, it doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't float. Um, so, but, but that's the philosophy. That, that's the philosophy, and, um, you know, that's a, that's a big one that you can readily see now uh, that has overlapped with many churches, uh, because churches have been on kind of on the front lines uh, of that, you know, battle, many of them, um, approaching it absolutely the wrong way, uh, approaching it with hatred and, you know, vitriol, and uh, you, you're never going to win anybody to Christ by standing in front of a, a building that's with a sign that says, God hates gays. That's never going to work, okay? Uh, that's just hatred, and, and it shouldn't be done. Um, but, you know, some, on the other hand, have been so willing to, to tolerate, um, you know, or not, be, not want to be perceived as being non-tolerant, that they have simply acquiesced uh, to, to, the, to the philosophy or thinking. Uh, so that's a more modern one, uh, where the, the actual organization or, or structure, and now people out here who are promoting that type of thing, the average Joe on the street, uh, if you went up and you asked them, are you a humanist? Well, they're probably not going to. They're probably not going to even know what it is, um, and they certainly don't think that you know. Well, you know. I mean, I'm going to go worship at the Church of Humanism, which actually there is such a thing, uh, but it is humanistic thinking, and it is driven by a humanistic uh, agenda on a political level uh, and on a very powerful level in, in those who create uh, various social policies. You, you know. Very humanistic in its, uh, in its thinking. Another place that we see uh, very readily is, uh, of course, as we mentioned already, evolutionary thought. Um, you know, I mean, why, you know why, why do we have such preference offered to, you know, evolution when, you know, it's a theory. Um, it, it's, a, it's a theory that, you know, it, well, let's make it as simple as possible. It's not a law. Um, it has its problems, uh, and even proponents of it will tell you that it has its problems, some of them very major. Uh, some of them, when they're being very honest, will tell you that some of the problems are almost ungetoverable. Um, they're, they're difficult uh, to, to overcome those. Uh, but, you know, why does, you know, evolutionary thinking, Big Bang, all of that, receive preference uh, when it comes to, for instance, teaching in schools? I mean, who do you think is driving that agenda? You know, uh, it, well, it's, it's political and social change agents which um, are organized under this broad umbrella of, you know, you know humanism or humanism, humanistic types uh, of thinking. Um, you know, they're the ones that drive the agenda. Okay. So to kind of put it out there in the plainest form, you know, possible, what are the tenets? What does the humanist believe? Well, if you want to read the full thing uh, and... Uh, you can do it. Just go to the internet and type in Humanist Manifesto 2. Uh, and it's a big, long, quite frankly, boring document um, that is pretty much, uh, pretty much states the following. Okay? Man is, a, man is the highest uh, of all beings and uh, everything else kind of centers around supporting uh, man, his individuality and choices. Uh, if you want to borrow the phrase from Grecian philosophy, man is, uh, <clears throat> you know, man is the center of all things. Okay? Um, they believe that uh, freedom of expression 
uh, is uh, another ultimate tenet of uh, man's reality. Uh, you, you have the right to express yourself uh, in uh, any way that you desire. Uh, and um, to do so in an uninhibited fashion, whether that be uh, verbally, whether that be politically, whether that be sexually, um, you know, and then they have some more uh, direct statements uh, that are designed to go towards Christianity. Uh, there is no God. Uh, there, there is no God. Um, the, the Bible is just a, a book. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, is not a savior. Uh, and um, pretty much anything that, you know, the Bible stands for is invalid. Uh, and um, what it doesn't say in the manifesto is that because of all those, those things are the case, uh, then those who believe that are people who are inferior uh, in their ability to think and reason and, you know, live their life to the fullest. Okay. So that's not all that it says um, because some of it just doesn't really kind of uh, impact our discussion of spiritual things. Uh, but that's pretty much what the Humanist Manifesto, uh, you know, says. Um, but look it up. You know, re you can read it for your yourself. Um, in the Humanist Manifesto, they will talk about uh, a lot about, you know, uh, sexual freedom uh, down to the point where they are unwilling to uh, unwilling to say that anything in the name of, uh, you know, humanistic pursuit uh, is, you know, wrong, is wrong. Uh, so, you know, much of what we know today as being criminal, uh, it, under their umbrella of human sexuality, would just simply be a person's right to choose. Okay? Uh, you know. Would let a lot of people out of prison, uh, but you know that's uh, their definition. Uh, down to you know incest, uh, etc. Um, you know all of that's permissible. Uh, all of that's permissible because that you know is serving somebody's ethic. Um, Julian Huxley again. I use the word humanist to mean someone who believes that man is just as much a natural phenomenon as an animal or plant. That his body, mind, and soul were not supernaturally created, but are produced, uh, or excuse me, are products of evolution. And that he is not under the control or guidance of any supernatural being or beings, but has to rely on himself and his uh, own power. Okay? And that describes humanism in a nutshell. You are on your own, but you are free to pursue whatever it is that you choose and can pursue on your own. Okay. So ultimately, it's about liberation to do as you, you know, please. Um, in that, uh, they, they share the philosophy of many, many ancient religions, um, including uh, Gnosticism, uh, which really was uh, this convoluted back alley way of freeing people to do whatever they wanted to uh, and claim that it didn't affect them spiritually. Uh, but uh, anyhow, that's the bell. Next time we're going to kind of dig into uh, a, a little bit about, um, you, you know, uh, Christianity uh, and uh, what we should do as Christians uh, because of humanism. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the uh, agendas that uh, humanism drives uh, and uh, how it is uh, that, you know, we should be reacting uh, to those things. But uh, just <clears throat> read through the, read through the, the study guide and... Uh, Come back next time ready to share. Appreciate everybody's thought. You can turn in your Bibles. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses uh, 20, 36 through 40. That's where we're going to begin our lesson uh, this morning. And then from that point on, we're pretty much going to be back in the Psalms. So if you want to go ahead and start turning there as well, while you're turning there, um, I w it was brought to my attention that I forgot perhaps one of our more important announcements of the day. Uh, and that is, it is our potluck Sunday. Uh, we have a potluck dinner uh, immediately following our services uh, every first Sunday of the month. Uh, if you are visiting with us, feel free to come. Uh, we usually have lots uh, of food uh, and uh, it kind of saves you from going and waiting in a line at a restaurant or, or making your own food. Uh, you are welcome. Don't think you need to have brought something, uh, but come and enjoy some good fellowship uh, with us uh, today. 
immediately following uh, our services. Uh, if you simply go out this door, make a right, go around the building, you see a separate building uh, that we call our, our annex, uh, and um, that's where we uh, have our meal. So uh, if you can, feel free to join us uh, after the services uh, this morning. Sam and Marsha Savage got in their cabin cruiser on the west coast of our country on a fairly chilly evening, though it was still in the summer months, and set off for what they thought was going to be a picnic on the water as the sun set. Along with a couple of friends of theirs, they weighed anchor and took off across the the water coming out of the small inlet where, inlet where their boat was docked and into the larger bay going just above an idol making their way slowly across the water and then eventually into a bay where they would go out through one of the many passes onto the ocean and there watch the sun go down. As they made their way out of the inlet and into the, to the larger bay, they enjoyed the scenery around them that so often comes with such a trip. They saw the wildlife in the sea, some along the shore, some in the air, even got to see one of the local rowing teams and wave and give their well wishes to them as they passed by. As they made their way across the bay and came to the first, the first of the outlets that would put them onto the ocean, they were waved off told that the bridge would not go up and they could not pass. Undaunted from having their evening of watching the sunset with their friends who had traveled from distance to to be with them, they went on to, to the next pass. And they would continue to do this for at least two other passes. And eventually when they came to the last one, It was announced to them, I'm assuming over a radio, that the waters were just too tumultuous to get through the pass. And there was fear that even though they would raise the bridge, that the surf would knock their boat, which was a large boat, into one of the pilings of the bridge. So eventually they they gave up going out onto the ocean, turned their boat around, and as they headed back toward home, still enjoying the scenery, the night began to fall. And as it got darker and darker, and as they got closer and closer to the home, they they noticed that every once in a while, out in the distance, they could see a, a red cross just illuminate and then disappear, illuminate and disappear. And of course, they, they were curious And so they kind of steered the boats mildly in that direction to find out what it was. And of course, going at that slow pace, it took them some time. In total, the whole whole trip from the time of the outlet all the way through the passes and turning around was about three hours. But the light of the cross kept flashing to them. And as they finally uh, approached, they began to see things in the water. And the husband at one point said that he told his wife, who would dump all these coconuts in the water? And they figured out pretty quickly they weren't coconuts. They were heads of human beings bobbing up and down in the water. See that rowing team that they had passed on the way out? Their boat was actually capsized by the same waves that kept them from going out into that larger ocean. And they had spent an hour or more in that frigid water that you sometimes find on the west coast. But it eventually made their way to one of the buoys. And when they got to the buoy, one of the people in the, in the rowing team had taken their jacket and thrown it over the buoy. And on that jacket was a reflective tape. And every once in a while, the light of the boat would hit that reflective tape and form the shape of a cross. And to this day, that husband feels that God led them to that place. Now, I don't know whether that was the case or not. I wasn't there and I didn't witness any of that other than the fact that the story is told that it happened. 
But I do know this, that when it comes to communication with God, it it is very often for us a, a troublesome thing to kind of come to grips with. It is sometimes a very difficult thing for us to really look at and say, yeah, that's where I am. See, we look at a story like that, and we see that story, and it's, it it's a, seems to be such a marvelous thing and a great tale to, to tell. And certainly it very well may be the case that God did lead those people there. But many of us look at that and we think, how come I don't have a prayer life like that? Where, where the communication seems to be so clear, and when it happens, it's kind of like, oh, God sent me here. God is doing this for me, and God is doing that for me, and God is leading me in this direction. God is leading me away from this direction because the waves are big. And the seas are high, but over here I can do some good and save some people. How come it's not that clear for us? In this month that we focus on prayer, I want us to give some really good and deep thought, not simply to the notion of prayer itself, I don't want us to simply go and read some prayers that are in the scripture or create by rote some prayer that we can just repeat over and over as if that's going to bring us a profitable prayer life. Instead, what I want us to do is to go beyond that to the practice of prayer. See, because that's what Paul meant when he said things like pray without ceasing, right? He didn't just say, come up with some mantra that's yours, you know, and then just repeat it over and over and over. I'm pretty sure that's not what Paul had in mind. What Paul had in mind is to be of such a heart that you are the kind of person that in all things, you are prayerful. This morning, we're going to look at five prayers. Five prayers. Each of them has multiple messages for us. You see, there are lots of prayers in Scripture. Each one of these prayers we look at this morning has a multiplicity of, me- uh, of messages, but I'm going to bring out one message from each prayer in-, in the hopes that we can use them to help us refine our prayer life and, and gain the thing that we most need in prayer. And-, and that is the realization that prayer is really all about relationship. Prayer is all about your relationship with God. If we don't first and foremost know that, create that, understand that, foster that, live that, then prayer becomes kind of a moot point and an exercise that is at best benign, at worst is emasculated of any kind of possible outcome. Prayer number one, if you go back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, and we're going to dwell on these, so I really want you to turn there, and I really want you to consider the words, realizing that these are words that are written by fellow human beings who no doubt had similar struggles that like we have. They no doubt had similar hurdles like like we have. They no doubt had the same questions that you and I have, especially in those difficult times. You know, why am I having to go through this in my marriage? Or why am I having to do this in the relationship with my kids or with my coworkers or all of those types of things? Why is it happening to me? These people were in those types of situations, and typically out of those situations is born, I had nothing. There we go. Prayer number one is what I simply like to call the prayer of vulnerability. The prayer of vulnerability. You know, if you go back to the book of Matthew in 22 and verses 36 through 40, Christ is asked this question. Which one is the greatest commandment in the law? And we all remember what he says, right? He he says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. And then he goes on and he says, this is the great and first command. Then the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. When Jesus spoke those words, he meant he meant for us to take away a message that had everything to do with us having a relationship with God rather than just simply the repetition of some ideas that we are disconnected from or that we just learn by rote and sort of throw out when we need to have them. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That's relationship. It's you giving your all to someone else. What would you call that? You know, husbands and wives. Do you look at your spouse and think, well, you know, I, I only have about a third of him. You know, guys, you look at your wife and you think, well, I hope to only have 10%. You know, I, I don't know what your percentage is, right? No, we look at each other and we like to think to ourselves, we're giving each other our all, our best. So you go over to the Psalms and you read this Psalm right there near the end. And Psalm 39 is much larger than 23 and 24. But he says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be in me or be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Many, many times in the book of Job, Job would cry out a prayer just like this. Because Job knew that he had pursued righteousness. And yet his friends come along and they say, no, Job, you've done something horrible. You had to have. Look at your life. It's a mess. It's horrible. You had to have done something wrong. Job would cry out, examine me. Give me my day in court. Look at my heart. See that I'm not that kind of person. Every child of God needs to pray the prayer of vulnerability. And if you're not willing to pray that prayer that says, God, take a look at me. My heart is open to you. I want you to tell me where these dark spots are. I want you to tell me what that one thing is. You remember that exchange Christ would have with the rich young ruler we sometimes call him? This one thing you lack. What is my one thing? What are my two things? For some of us, what are our dozen things, right? You know, what do I need to change? God, look at my heart. Show me the way. Point me in the pathway. We need to be open and vulnerable to God revealing things to us that will show us how it is that we get better. You know what the opposite of this is? Pride. Is it not? I mean, take a good hard look. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But pride will stand in the way. And pride will close us off. And pride will put up the wall. And you know, many other things will too. But we've got to be vulnerable. And we've got to have that kind of heart that says, look at me. Find that grievous way. Lead me in the everlasting. And of course, we open up to people, don't we? I mean, hopefully you, again, back to spouses, have opened up to, you know, your spouse. And they know things about you that other people don't know. When you have that closed off nature, and your spouse even knows very little about you, you are the opposite of vulnerable. We've got to let God in. Now, here's the thing. Does God know already? Sure he does. That's not really the point, though. The point is is that we are willing to let him in, and we are willing to trust in him, and we are willing to give him everything that we are. But you have to open to him. There's a story that was once told by Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Uh, About one night after his studies, he had gathered with his family around the table, and they were having some kind of meat to eat, and they had a puppy. And the puppy came sort of, you know, bounding out like puppies do, tripping all over itself. And it sat down right next to him. And it looked right at him for 30 minutes. 
resolute in its focus on the meat that was on the table. And Martin Luther wrote these words. He said, oh, if I could pray the way that the dog watches the meat, focused, fully ready to receive. You've got to be vulnerable. You've got to open yourself to God. Number two, second prayer is over in Psalm 51. Another psalm that most of us probably know. Most scholars think it's a psalm that was written by David as a psalm of repentance. Uh, after his sin with Bathsheba and uh, all of the difficulty that came after that, the death of his son, and of course, having killed his friend, it weighed heavy on his heart. And this is the prayer of forgiveness. See, we open ourselves to God. God comes along and he tells us, you've got this. Here's the problem. Anybody ever go to a mechanic? Nobody here has gone to a mechanic. That's okay. You've gone to a mechanic. You've gone to a doctor. You've gone to somebody who puts something on you or your thing or your vehicle, and, and they diagnose a problem. They come back and they tell you, first of all, they tell you in language you don't understand, right? Your mechanics have their own language. Doctors have their own language. And, you, you know, they're, they're telling you things, and you're like, tell me like I'm five years old, right? You know, and so they explain it to you. They explain it to you, and you've got this, this, and this wrong, and you need to do this, this, and this. Do we walk away and simply do nothing? Well, if you're the doctor, you, you probably know that a lot of people are going to walk away and do nothing, even though you've told them and you're the expert and they know better. And it's just like the mechanic, probably the same thing, but it's true spiritually as well. When we open our hearts and God finds that thing that we need to, to fix or improve on, we've got to be willing to do something about it. And it begins with this notion of forgiveness. David wrote, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. See, the simple fact of the matter is, is that when we open ourselves to God, we're human beings, and God's going to find those things that we do wrong. There's a passage in Paul's writings there in the book of Romans that tells us all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we all miss the mark. We all do things that are, that are wrong according to the standard of God. Now, Paul wasn't the first one to say that. He's not going to be the last one to say that. There's none righteous. No, not one. Other men have said that. So God finds these sins in, in us. But he doesn't leave us without means to do something about it. But it requires us to go to him and to seek the forgiveness that only he can give. And this forgiveness idea is such an important idea. Again, God knows. But you see, it's not just about you coming and telling God. It's about you coming and laying it open before God putting off that burden that you will bear. I think it's the same reason why in the New Testament we're told to confess our faults one to another. Well, that's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, I've got to go to these other people and tell them what I've done wrong? What, what purpose does that serve? I mean, how do I know they're not going to use it against me? And all, we can make up all kinds of scenarios for why we don't do it. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that it's cathartic. It allows us to set aside the burden. But when we go to God, it's not only set aside, it's blotted out, wiped away. We are free from, as he puts here, blood, guilt, guiltiness. The only way you have your sins taken away is by taking them to God. The only way we have our sins 
washed away, blotted out, removed, is by taking them to our God, confessing them before him in prayer. Like David did when he fell on his knees. I'm sure this wasn't a David standing. I mean, can you imagine, it, it, you know, how this prayer was spoken? Ever, I like to think of that. I like to think what must it have been like when David spoke this prayer? I'm pretty sure that his demeanor wasn't, have mercy on me, oh God. Yeah, I'm guilty of a lot of stuff, and, well, some of it I'm not. And, yeah, I mean, it wasn't probably half-hearted and nonchalant. David was a man of great passion, and these words were no doubt spoken with a passion, and you can see that in them. And forgiveness is an important thing. And we must embrace it and seek God's forgiveness. Prayer number three. It's the prayer of self-awareness. The prayer of self-awareness. Now, these are my titles that I'm applying to them. You, you may apply some other title, but it goes along with the point that I'm drawing out. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you, forgive, <clears throat> will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall the enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foe rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted you in, in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, and I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, the thing I want you to notice about this psalm is not necessarily what it proclaims about God. Many of the psalms proclaim the great wonders of God and the great work of God and how God has the power to forgive and exalt and lift up and exhort. Many of the psalms overlap in that regard. But the thing that I want you to notice is the questioning here. You see, here's a person who, when life didn't go their way, when the enemies were, were coming, when, when they were having to wait, as Philip led that song, on the Lord, when they were in that difficult time, and they had these feelings and thoughts did they take them before God? See, sometimes we, we, we kind of make prayer this sort of generic thing. Many people feel as if they, they aren't great at prayer. And it really has a lot to do with the fact that they feel like they are experts on the thing that they pray about most, and the thing they pray about most is self when in reality, many people are very unaware of who they are and how they feel. And if they are, they certainly don't let it be known in their prayer life. We have this impression of prayer that it should be this kind of very staid, sort of formalized, kneeling on my bed, holding my hands a certain way, saying certain words in a certain order type of thing. Nice, clean, and neat, and folded like a t-shirt in the drawer at a military establishment. I don't think that's prayer. I'm pretty sure the guys who were in prison in the first century, praying all night, weren't real concerned about much of what we just said. And I think most of us in our hearts have that passion and desire to say things to God like, God, why me? How could you do this to me? And we want to say those things that are in our heart, but for some reason we don't dare. And that's why we call this the prayer of the self-aware. See, you have feelings. And you have thoughts, and you're a human being, and you have frailties, and you can't be afraid when you become vulnerable to let God into that. Prayer is not just something you just repeat over and over, as we've already said. 
but it's a relationship that we have with God. Do we talk to him like we have a relationship with him? I mean, if you talk to your friends how you pray, how would that go? Dear so-and-so, wife of mine, you know, and we go on and we give tons of titles and then I bestow your good works and you know, we say the same thing to them every time. How deep is that relationship going to be? Not very deep. Quite frankly, they're going to get bored with you real quick. God doesn't expect us to set aside our humanness somehow in prayer life. The story is told about a father and son. One day had to go and run some errands downtown, go to the diner. They sit up in the diner and they're kind of in a hurry. So the food comes and the father looks at the son and he says, Son, we're just going to say a silent prayer. Bows his head, says his prayer. Looks over at the son in the Sunday school, still praying, still praying. And the father's like, yeah, taught him well. On and on and on. Finally, one of the kid's eyes open, looks up, and his head comes up. And the father says, son, what were you praying about for so long? And the boy looks at the father and says, I don't know. It was a silent prayer. You know, sometimes that's the way we are, silent prayer. That mean we say nothing? We expect someone else to be praying for it? I mean, what is that? You've got to pray the prayer that is in your heart. And you've got to open yourself in that kind of vulnerability. Next prayer. Prayer that has motivated praise. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Excuse me. 103. Praise the Lord. O oh, my soul, all my innermost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and the crown, you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires. And he goes on and he talks about the Lord's works there in verse 6 and how he's slow to anger and has this abounding love and compassion on his children and how we should obey his will. Let's pick up reading there at verse 19. It says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven and the kingdom, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servant who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. What do you think the author's writing about? Praising the Lord, right? That's what he's writing about. Now, if you want to read a, uh, one that repeats it even more, go over to Psalm 105 and read there. Uh, it's like almost every other word is praise the Lord, praise the Lord. A lot of the Psalms are that way. Give God praise. But one of the things that you are going to notice in this particular psalm is that it's not just praise without meaning. It's not praise without motive. The writer here says, praise the Lord, and then he gives you tons of reasons why you should be praising God. And the reason this prayer is important is because it matches up so well with what we are told very, very often about our own lives. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And then the line that's always got me uh, of that song is this one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Surprise me? You know why it surprises you? Because you don't think about it that often. We kind of take it for granted, don't we? We go through our day and somehow in some place during the day, it just sort of becomes all about us. And we have to train ourselves to really give thought to the motivation behind why we meet on occasions like this to give him that praise. But the other thing that I want you to notice before we go to our last one is where this praise comes from. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being... Verse 2, O my soul. Go to the last verse, O my soul. From deep down in the pit of everything that I am and everything that defines me, I am praising God because I've counted 
the blessings that he's given to me. And it's an amazing and powerful thing. That's why when we get to the New Testament, the places like John chapter 4, verse 24, after being told that God is a spirit, and after we're told that God desires worshipers, we're told that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Praise him. (laughs) But there's every reason in the world to praise him. Final thing. The prayer of the Christ follower. And for this one, we're going to go over to Psalm 9, reading verses 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in time of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Being a follower means that we are willing to lay down our lives for him. Look at all the terms in the New Testament that describe what it means to follow Christ. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Whoever shall win his life shall lose it. Look at all those things that Christ said, and there's nothing in there that would indicate any way at all that you can be somewhat committed to Christ. That you can be somewhat a a follower of him who is the stronghold, of him who will lift you up, of him in whom you must have placed your trust. Over in Luke chapter 10, verse 41, Martha and Mary receive Christ as a visitor, and at one point, Martha is busying herself with household chores, and Mary is there at Jesus' feet, and he cries out to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. See, that one thing that we need to be concerned with is being a follower of Christ. Being a follower of our Savior. Letting Him be the stronghold. Letting Him lift us up. Letting Him be the one that is our strength and in whom we've placed our trust. Man, that ought to be our constant prayer. It's so contradictory to what we sometimes think. Man, I, I got to do this on my own. Or you know, I got to lift myself up by my you know, bootstraps or whatever it is. No, what you need to do is lean more heavily upon Christ. That's what you need to do. He's the stronghold, not you. Someone once put it this way. When you're on a boat and you throw your anchor to the shore... Do you pull the shore toward you or the boat toward the shore? You pour the boat to the shore, not the shore toward you. See, you have to lean upon Christ. You have to depend upon him for understanding. That means you go to him. You seek him. Are you seeking him this morning? Have you done so and become a, a follower of his only to find yourself in difficult times and struggling? Let your struggles be known. Be that vulnerable person who opens up to, to God and, and your fellow brothers and sisters. See, God put us in this family for a reason so we can help one another. Let it be known. And maybe you've not become a child of God. And maybe, maybe it's time. Have you heard his word? You see, you have to hear the word of God. You got to know something about God so you can put your trust in him. That's why Paul would write in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when we hear that word, it it ought to be convicting to us. See, that's faith. Faith isn't just some kind of, you know, well, I believe that's true type of thing. Faith is a strong conviction about something. So has the word convicted you? Do you have that faith? Where's that faith leading you? 
Does it lead you to want to repent of the wrong things that you've done? Now, repentance means you just change your mind. And, of course, that change of mind leads to a change of life that says, now I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to say the same things. I'm going to do the same things. I'm going to have that mind that was his. And that's really what confession is all about. Literally, the word means to say the same thing. With confession off our lips, we attain to our salvation according to Romans. Paul in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. And then, have you entered the waters of baptism? Have you reenacted that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? So he can wash you clean of the sin that is part of that old man that you leave behind there. So you can become that new creature, walk in newness of life, according to Paul in Romans 6. If you're here and you need to do that, don't delay. Why would you want to delay coming to the one who has the answers to all of the questions that you would have? Won't you come this morning as together we stand to